Imperial soldiers marched down from the southernmost outpost of the Empire, prepared for war. 20,000 soldiers stood on the banks of a river that none had ever seen, sending an ultimatum to the enemy, a group they called savages, the Mapuche. Submit or die. Kneel before us and we may let you live as our slaves, but fight back and we will destroy your entire way of life. But the Mapuche said no. They would rather die than submit. They'd show these foreigners what savage truly meant. And six days later, those savages limped home victorious. They would not be slaves to this foreign empire, not now, not ever. The Empire of the Sun had been defeated. The Inca had been stopped. A hundred years later, and the Mapuche were facing another empire, the Spanish. Again, they were forced to draw a line in the sand, to pay for their freedom with blood. On the banks of the Lumaco River, just a few hundred kilometers from where they'd stopped the Empire of the Sun, they stopped the empire on which the sun never sets. Just as with the Inca before them, the loss was devastating to the Spanish. It ended their imperial domination in Chile. In some small way, history had repeated itself. Which isn't all too surprising. After all, the history of empires is often a history of repetition, at least at its core. No two empires have ever been the same, and yet they've all shared a great many similarities. After all, what's the point of an empire? More land, more people, more power, more wealth. It's a long-standing aspect of human society. But to many, it seems as though the concept of empire only became important in the last few hundred years, or at least only negative in the last few hundred years. Today, the Inca are treated as historically interesting, but toothless. They aren't remembered as expansionists. They aren't remembered as slavers. If anything, they're remembered as Machu Picchu. But they were those things, and I'm interested in why we choose to forget those aspects. Empire is not a European invention, despite what a number of comments on this site might extol. Treating it as one only serves to undermine our ability to judge it with any real perspective. Resource wars are not uniquely American, simply because they're the most newsworthy and far-reaching. It's an understanding that defies the way the world has been run throughout history in all corners of the globe. There's a reason my wife's maiden name is The Turk, despite being a full-blooded Hungarian. In attempting to frame it that way, we both insult Europeans as inhumanly violent, and also non-Europeans as inhumanly incapable of violence. Neither are true, and neither remotely holds up to the light of history. If we act as though the reason European empires were so brutal was due to their racially inclined uniqueness, we'll be unnecessarily shocked the next time imperialism comes along following the same historical patterns. If the past has taught us anything, empires from further away with better technology likely won't be more inclined towards sustaining local rights and customs. But that isn't to say what the Europeans did in their expansion, or as their later iteration as Americans both North and South, wasn't an absolute tragedy. They committed untold genocides and wiped out hundreds of indigenous cultures. Nobody in their right mind would claim that their primary actions weren't brutal, violent, and indifferent to local lives. The work of expansionist empires is virtually always a tragedy, particularly to those being conquered. But that doesn't mean it was an entirely unique tragedy. It was simply unrivaled in speed, technology, disease, and distance. They were able to conquer people an entire world away, and in doing so, could care far less about what happened to them once they were ruled over. The underpinning of the Spanish Empire in the Americas was better defined by Cortes than de la Casas. The more out of sight the subjects, the more out of mind their welfare. It wasn't their lack of humanity that led to this, but the reality of human action throughout history. It would be hard to imagine that if the Inca had been in the position to conquer Europe before Europe had been in the position to conquer them, we wouldn't currently be living in a world where Cuzco is treated as the epicenter of evil, as many people consider Washington, Moscow, Beijing, or London today. But beyond the average myopic YouTube comment, my reason for writing this story was inspired by visiting outposts built by the Incans at the height of their expansion. They're referred to as Pucara, a style of fortress built at the furthest reaches of an empire. An empire that in the 16th century may well have been the largest on Earth. From these strongholds in the hills, they pushed out from the mountains well into the deserts, valleys, and coastlines that surrounded them. Few people realize just how far this empire spread. If you're having a coffee in the Chilean city of Santiago halfway down the country, you're still within Incan lands. 
They were a huge, violent, expansionist empire. For the most part, that's why we still remember them. Conquerors usually get their day in the sun, while the conquered are rarely remembered. It's just, that's not necessarily what we remember them for. But the Incan Empire wasn't exactly unique. When you compare the actions of the Inca with, for example, the Spanish who replaced them, there are many clear similarities. Empires rarely stray from a standard course. Incan rulers, in search of wealth and power, sent troops into lands inhabited by people speaking other languages with other cultures and other ways of life. They demanded personal, political, and religious submission, and when refused, sent troops beyond the ability of local warriors to take it by force. New subjects were sent to work as slaves for the empire, and only in doing so were they allowed to remain in their lands. Local religious symbols were changed to venerate new gods. Taxes were employed as a means of moving wealth from the conquered lands to the central authority. Assimilation and administration of distant regions was difficult to manage, so conquered leaders were executed, and whichever child was most likely to fall in line was taught in the new style and placed on the throne. When the Spaniards arrived, they followed a near-identical pattern, only with greater speed, advanced technology, and a true indifference to local suffering. This wasn't an empire looking to create a pastoral socialist dictatorship like the Inca, but an empire hell-bent on short-term wealth. They took the Mita system of forced labor and replaced it with the Economita system of true slavery. It didn't matter if a gold-mining slave died, the Spanish would force their relatives to replace them. It didn't matter if taking that laborer meant the lands wouldn't be farmed, the Spanish had all the food they needed at home. They could do this because they were bigger, because technology allowed it, because distance meant that the average Spaniard didn't have to see what was happening. But beyond the scale, their plan wasn't really all that different from those who came before them. Incan kings were told to submit, and when they failed to take Spanish leadership, they were executed. Their relatives were placed on the throne and made to convert their people in the name of the new regime. Slaves were taken in the same style as the Inca, but with a new form of wicked forcefulness that defined the empire. Catholicism was imposed on local areas of worship, and taxes in the form of gold and silver were collected in such numbers that it crashed the European economy. Just as the Inca before them, their empire spread on both the promise of wealth and the threat of death. While the extent of their cruelty was on an entirely different scale, and the wealth was rarely intended to be spread among the conquered people, None of what happened could be truly described as new. But the point of this story isn't to say that the Spanish did nothing wrong, or even that they did anything right. Personally, I have no vested interest in the outcomes of either the Spanish or Incan empires. But I think it'd be hard to argue that from a local perspective, the Spanish weren't worse. It's just that the glory of empires is rarely felt by the people being conquered. And yet, they've always existed, and they'll probably always exist. The real question to me is why don't we remember the Inca for the evil acts they did, just as we do the conquistadors? Is it because they have no more power? Because their system is no longer dominant? If so, I wonder how the Spanish system will be viewed once it's been eclipsed. Will it become like the Inca, a toothless historical artifact long dead to the world? Will its cities be remembered like Machu Picchu? How long will their history of slavery last in our collective memory? Most European empires have already fallen, and new ones are rising in an attempt to take their place. It likely won't be all too long before a conquistador of another name takes the world by force. And in all likelihood, if history is any indicator, they'll be just as bad as we were. Race is not a determinant of action. I believe if we want to judge the world in a way that builds a better future, we should remember empires not by their origin, size, technology, or creed, but by how they treated their subjects. The Spanish took the empire of the Inca and unarguably made it worse for the people who lived within it. But they also advanced it, led it, and created a new civilization from the ashes. The question was simply who benefited from the change. If the world only remembers the past that benefits them the most, there's little cause for the next conquistadors to be any less cruel than those who came before. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that information and history is beyond our personal experience of it. It's all of ours to share. No race has a monopoly on education. No race has a monopoly on atrocity. No race even truly exists. We should all know the story of the Inca, the Spanish, and the Mapuche. Not through the distorted lens of who's on top right now, but for what they did in their time. Education is all of ours to share, and we should remember it as it happened to everyone. Otherwise, we won't be prepared for what comes next. This is Rare Earth.